Okay. Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, January 22nd, 2020. We want 2020 vision, so we're going to get into the Word of God that we can have His vision on our lives and in His Word and study it together to see what we can learn. We are looking at the very beginning, a very good place to start. So we've gone all the way back to Genesis. We're in Genesis chapter 1. Technically, we're not even in verse 1 yet, but we kind of are because we talked about the first word, Bereshit. Just as a way of reminder, very quickly, Bereshit is beginning, it can be creator, it can be source, it can be generator. All of these words are accurate. I will get to what else is on the board. These two are the Hebrew way to spell it. You can spell it other ways also, but these are the most common that you will see, just in case if you come across it in something you're reading. And again, it means beginning. Our first three words that we're going to talk about today are Bereshit, Ara, Elohim. I'll tell you what the other words mean as we go along, but we were looking back into creation as an overview. We will get into a very detailed study because Genesis gets into a very detailed study, that we were seeing what we call typology in scripture. Typology is when you have a picture of something else that's being presented to you, and you have to look deeper to see typology in scripture, but when you do, it's fascinating the things that you will learn, the depths of the scriptures. As we were looking at it last week, we saw, and where I'll just read you quickly because we raced through um, three and four, points three and four, but we saw that the first four days of the recreation, and I'll tell you later why I call it recreation, we'll prove that point also, uh, but the first four days show us Yeshua, Jesus' redemptive work for us. We saw day one was a picture of his incarnation, his virgin birth, the Holy Spirit hovering over the face of the earth, the Holy Spirit hovering over Miriam, Mary to bring her, um, well, to make her pregnant. You know, we know that it was not with an earthly father, it was via the Holy Spirit. So we see the Spirit of God moving, day one, reminding us of this first step of his work to redeem us. He had to been born into the human race, but he also had to be fully God. We see that in his deity, in his incarnation. Day two spoke to us about the cross. It was the division, the separation. We saw in day two the firmament, firmament, um, the atmospheric heavens separated from the waters below, and we saw that was a picture of the cross. The cross separated the sun below from his father above. Remember, on the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? At the moment that Yeshua became literally the sin offering for us, God had to turn his back on sin, and in that moment is when he cried out in his agony, feeling that separation that confounds our minds because at the same time he's still God, one with God but in that human flesh and the death coming on, the punishment the wage of sin, he felt that separation that we see in day two, we saw that it was in the mind of God before the foundations of the world, we talked about that heavily last week so I'm just reminding you of it this week, that even the cross divides peoples even as the firmament divides waters and we're going to see that as we continue on because we're going to see there are peoples that are separated unto God. But let me get to day three first. Day three speaks of his resurrection. So we had his incarnation, we saw the death on the cross. Day three we see speaks of his resurrection. Uh, if we look at Genesis chapter one, we look at verse nine, we have let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, let the dry land appear, and it was so and then we come down to verse 12, and it says, The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. God saw that it was good. We see new life come out. There you see the picture of the resurrection. On the third day, life appears on the barren earth, and that would be a type of life coming out of death. And we know Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, arose on the third day. We also know, and I'm tipping my hand on this, but I like this point. Day two, when we're looking at the days of creation, when we say them, we'll see day two, the phrase, and God said it was good, is not there. The day that pictured his death. Not that his death was not good, but the fact there needed to be death. The fact that there was sin that needed to be atoned for. Day three, 
God says twice it was good. Two different times he blesses day three. Day three to the Jewish mind is Tuesday, because of the, where they start the first day of the week. You know, they have Shabbat. Shabbat ends sundown Saturday. And remember, you have to go sundown to sundown. So day three is our Tuesday. They just simply call it day three. They're very practical. <laughs> day three is a day that many brides choose to get married because they want the day God blessed twice. Just an interesting note. The fourth day, day three, it speaks of his resurrection. Life that comes out of death. We have a barren earth that's beginning to bring forth life. Um, and we saw that God saying it was good in verses 10 and verse 12, the, the two times. The fourth day speaks to us of his ascension. We're looking at Genesis 1. We're going to go, by the way, back to the very beginning and go through all these verses word by word, phrase by phrase, like we always do. This is just a quick overview to show you some of the types, some of the pictures in Scripture. So when we look at day 4, we're looking from verse 14 on, where God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs, for seasons, days, years. We'll talk about all of this. Let them, um, I'm going to get down to the two great lights. Verse 16 tells us there were two great lights. The greater to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. And he also made the stars. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. To govern day and night. I think I've read all that I need to read for my point right now. Two great lights. The greater light refers to us as the light of the world. That would be Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. The lesser light we know is the moon. The moon reflects the light of the sun. Well, if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, we will be like the moon, reflecting the light of the sun of God. That is the light to the world, and we'll reflect that light out to the world just as the moon gives light to the world. We see that Yeshua is seated in the heavens now, Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou here on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Um, I also have a reference, I don't remember right now, let me look it up real quick, it's Acts 2, Acts 2, verses 33 to 35, and this is still on your cross-references that I gave you, there are a few extra verses that will be coming, I'll try to make sure I point that out to you, but Acts 2, 33 says, moreover, he has been exalted, oh, okay, it's telling us again, to the right hand of God, speaking of Messiah, has received from the Father what he promised, namely the Ruch HaKodesh, and has poured out this gift which you're both seeing and hearing, and it goes on. But what I'm referencing there is that the Lord is in heaven. The Holy Spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh, came down to us and dwells us since the Lord returned into heaven. And that's what's also in that verse. But what we're seeing right now is even though his glorious light, in essence, is hid from us, we cannot see it the way that like I'm seeing you right now, that's like the sun at night. We don't see the sun, but we know the sun's still there, don't we? And we know that light is still shining. The light of the world is shining 24-7 if you want to put him into the time frame. The light of the world knows no power failure. So back into the light. Yes, he is with us. And one day he will come as the sun of righteousness, with healing in his wings. That's Malchi, Malchi, chapter 4, verse 2. And every eye will see him. We read that in Revelation. You read it in Revelation 1, verse 7, and then we read it in Revelation 19 when he's coming back. We read it in Matthew 24, the end of 24. I think it starts with verse 30, where it says, As the, the lightnings from the east to the west, so the coming of the Son of Man be. And he will be the light in the world for the millennium. And we know he's the light of the new Jewish lion, our heavenly home. Mm -hmm. So we've got a great light. Yes? Slow down. I'm sorry? Can you slow down? Can I slow down? <laughs> <laughs> I can try. <laughs> okay, is there anything in particular you need repeated? No, it's just I speak in I'm sorry. Lord God, help me. <laughs> I will try. I think maybe as we get into, and we're going to start now, the, the first by verse that might help. You know, when I'm doing an overview. And she'll have the CD to review her too. And you can get the CDs, which are great because you can hit pause. And I know what you're saying because when I listen, I usually have to hit pause, pause, pause to whoever I'm listening to also to take notes and take it all in. But you notice I'm trying to slow down. I just... 
don't know if I'll stay there, but I will try Brenda. <laughs> okay, with all that in mind, let me remind you, in our account in the Bible, when we're studying the heavens, we're going to study creation and all that, but God's intent with the Bible was not to give us how the heavens go, but how to go to heaven. So we're not looking for a huge scientific explanation on a level that satisfies the brainiacs. <laughs> now, having said that, can the Word of God speak to them on that level and satisfy them? <coughs> can scientists defy the Word of God? No. no. They've never been able to. We'll talk more about that in just a bit. I've got some great things to bring out to you scientifically because we do touch on it. It's just we're not going to stay there and try to explain everything we can't anyway because God's greater than we are. So, back to the very beginning. Back to chapter 1, back to verse 1, and in your English you do read in the beginning. In our Hebrew, again, it's the word Bereshit. Now, in Bereshit, in the middle, remember, vowels aren't there in the Hebrew. So actually what you have is the Resh, and you have the Shin. When you put this together, you have the word in Hebrew, Rosh. We'll put an O in there because that's what you hear. Rosh, again, means head. Again, it's the generator, the source, the beginner. You have all that in that word, bare sheet. So even though it's saying in the beginning, it's kind of like you've got a double in it. I'll put it that way. The first two letters of bare sheet give us the, the B, the bait, and the R. I'm going to go this way. And again, I'm going to take the freedom because... The way you hear it isn't the E sound. You hear it more like an A sound. So, bar. Bar sheet. You can hear bear sheet, but bar <coughs> is often the way that it's also translated. Or a lot of the Hebrew will put it like that and then go on. Bear sheet. Okay? And when they do that, they, that means that there's something missing there. Just like when we do a conjunction, we put the apostrophe. When we see it with the A, we see the word bar. We're going to see that in our second word, barad. Bar means sun. So when you see bar and rosh in bare sheet, you're seeing the head is, I didn't put it down, you're seeing the head is the sun, and you're seeing the sun is the creator. Wait a minute. It says, in the beginning, God created now you're saying to me, in the beginning, Jesus created. Yes. <laughs> they both are involved. They both are deity. They both are equal. They both are partners in it. And we're going to see that they're not alone in it because by the time we get to verse 2, we have the Spirit of God moving on the face of the earth. We see all three, the Son, the Father, and the Spirit, involved in creation, and we see the first two in the very first word in Bereshit. God is the head also, as well as the Son. Okay? Um, make sure I gave you everything I want. In that first word, we'll look in a little bit about the Son being the creator, because we actually have that the Son is the creator, the Son is the generator, the Son is the source. We'll look at that well, but we're going to, before we get there, look at Barad. In the beginning, created. That's what Barad means, okay? Created. I'll put that up here for you. Barad means created. But again, because of the root, and Hebrew is very important, you go back to the roots, it's called the shorsh. It's the, like the spine that your, all your bones are connected to. So right here again, we have the emphasis again, actually saying the sun created. So in our first two words, we have it repeated again and again. We're getting a point. When God says it, it's important. When he's repeating it, it's very important, although it's very important the first one too. But it's emphasized, let me put it that way. Now here's where, before I go back and explain more, I want to bring in that third word, Elohim. Elohim is a word you may be familiar with. Let me tell you in Hebrew, I lost my, I'll use the red. In Hebrew, the I am is plural. So I'm going to put down here plural. And when we take that off, we're left with Elo. 
Again, you might see it spelled often E-L-A-H. Doesn't matter, E-L-A-H or E-L-O-H. And you'll see it in its short form, E-L. Each one of these is God. Okay, all three of those equal God. So, now when you add on plural, in English we add on S. Okay, makes it more than one. Hebrew they add on the I am. So what you now literally have out of our first three words are, in the beginning, created God's plural. Now, very interesting when we get into the Hebrew grammar, something happens that to me is wow. <laughs> this verb is a singular verb. <coughs> There are plural verbs, there are singular verbs. A singular verb is looking at one doing an action. Tom ran down the street. There'd be a different phrasing, a different way of doing it in Hebrew if it was Tom and Jan ran down the street, or Tom and Dick, whatever that is. <laughs> Dick and Jane. <laughs> Let's do it my way. Sammy and Jacob. <laughs> have is a singular verb, but we have a plural noun that's acting out the verb. So we have God's creating, plural, one act, one movement, as if the plurality is one. Do you follow me? Yes. I'm trying to make sure I'm not going too fast. <laughs> okay, let me take you to something that, because you were with me, if you were, in our class before this, where we shared a lot of our Jewish foundation for our roots of belief. We went to the most important prayer taught in Judaism on the lips of the Jewish people. The very good, somebody remember. The first thing in the morning, the last thing at night, the last thing they want on their lips when they are dying, it's called the Shema. I don't know what I did with my blue. I walked away with it. <laughs> Shema. That means here. Not you are here. It means here. Listen. Okay? The Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear me in my prayer today refer to our God as the one true and living God. Okay, in, I'm going to have to erase. I think I can take Rosh and head off. In our Shema, the last word in the Hebrew is Echad, and that means one. There's another word in Hebrew. The actual correct spelling is Yahid, but again, you will see some people spell it a little more like it sounds. That also means one. Two very different words both mean one. When Hebrew has that, there's a reason for there being two different words. So, we have to look at what it's telling us about each one. When we look at Yahid, Yahid is a singular one. I'll put up here singular. The first time that we really see that introduced to us in Scripture in a way that we can really grasp hold, I think maybe it's not the first time, but a good time, it's with Yitzhak, Isaac. God said to Abraham, take your only son. Take your Yahi son. Take your one son. Okay? Singular. Now, Echad means a divide or can mean a divided one. Okay, what is a divided one? It's one something that has parts. I like to use the egg, even though it's not the perfect example, it's a good example. An egg has a shell, a yolk, and a white. But you have one egg. That would be a hook. Okay? I have a cup here. This cup is yaki. It's one cup. That's it. But if I had an A, if I'd known I was going to say it, I would have brought it. <laughs> Means it can be divided. Now, God chooses every word in Scripture for a reason. Every word is important. That's why we study word by word in this study. Because 
if you pass by a word, you're going to pass by something that's very meaningful. When God refers to himself, he does not refer to himself in the singular. He refers to himself in that one that can be divided. When we see that, we see our teaching here, do we not? Elohim, a divided God, created, well, we know, it's the heavens and the earth. We haven't gotten to that yet, but we have the divided God created. Now we can see the scripture is not going against scripture, but it's helping us understand that we see from scripture both God created and the Son created, and yet we're talking about one God, and that's why we have a singular verb, because they worked in a unity. When we get the Holy Spirit in there, we call it a triunity, trinity. So we see the equality of the Godhead. We see, in my mind, my favorite word, an affable God <laughs> who is too big to be confined, to be constrained, to be put into one something. Even though he is one something, he's still so magnanimous that we have to see it in this division to really begin to fully understand. Yes? I am reminded that the father's before the letter in Hebrew is also Thank you. Good point. I will bring it out, and that is in the Hebrew all of faith. We have 22 letters. I draw Hebrew letters horribly. <laughs> I need my son dope, who does have, has an artist's hand. But to, just to get the point across, I'm going to bring, if I could bring three. Boy, that's bad. <laughs> we, I should call it up on, on my phone and send my phone around. It's called the letter Sheen. Boy, that's bad. Let me bring you. That's, that's worse than the normal. <laughs> okay, let me use my fingers. It looks like a W. Yes, Brenda's right. It has a base at the bottom. I'm going to use my own fingers because they do it better, okay? A W with a base at the bottom. You know, we do W with separate, but if you put all three branches together, tie them to one base, all three of those, whatever you want to call them, are all equal, okay? That's the letter of all the all faith, out of 22 letters that God chose to stand for himself, the letter Sheen, or they'll say Shin. This S H I N, but I don't want you to think of the shin. <laughs> and depending on your pronunciation, the same way we have uh, potato, potato, tomato, tomato, we have a little differentiation in Hebrew. If you learn Hebrew from my, well, you can't now because he's in heaven, but our beloved rabbi that my dad led to the Lord, who was Moroccan, you learn it with a Moroccan accent. That's a lot of fun. But this letter shin, the letter W, what we're seeing again. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, equal, all three tied into that one base. We have one unit, three ways that, that we see him presented, three and one, our triune God. And that's what we really have by the time we added the Spirit in the second verse. The first verse introduces us to God the Father and God the Son, and the second verse introduces us to God the Holy Spirit. The three in one. Uh, I don't want to just feed it to death, but it is so rich and so much, and there's so much there. Um, I thought I was doing it now, but apparently it's coming up in a little bit. Yeah, it's coming up in a little bit. Um, actually, let me just go over so I make sure I give us everything, um, because I'm going to get to the point where we see in Scripture the creation from the view of God and from the view of Yeshua Jesus. One thing I want to say before that, though, is notice we start off with in the beginning. When was that? In the beginning. That's a good way to put it. In the beginning. <laughs> it does not start in, say, in uh, 0 AD or in 6000 BC. We're not given a date. That wasn't the point of what God is showing us here in creation. And one thing that you may or may not want to agree with, and you're free to use the mind. Remember, God gave you a brain. He wants you to use it. There can be an understanding of an old earth that's older than man. Okay, notice that. I'm not telling you man is millions of years old, billions of years old, but I can't tell you that the earth isn't. And when science comes out with what they consider proofs that we have an old earth, I can say, well, that's fine. 
I don't know when God created it. I do know that something happened to this earth because we, in essence, have a story of a recreation, and I will show you how we get that from the Hebrew. So this earth could have been around for a long time. It could have been around for a short time. The one thing I do know, it hasn't been around as long as God. Because God created it. God predates it. But I can't tell you when that was. Okay? There's nothing said about the appearance of the earth, its inhabitants, or God's mode of creation in the beginning. He just simply says, in the beginning, God created. Boom. That's it. It's the bare fact, and it's presented to us as fact without question. It doesn't give any room for a question. Questions have come later. We know that. But again, the intent of the scripture wasn't to teach and answer every scientific question. The intent was to teach God created, and what he created was this earth. Notice also, there's not an explanation for whether you want to believe in God or not. God does not seek to prove his preexistence to you. He just states it fact. That's it. No room for argument. His existence is revealed by creation because anyone... Mm, who uses their mind, who looks at this creation, has to believe in a master designer. Yes. I am sorry. I'm calling out the evolution. You know what? I'm not sorry. <laughs> if, if you are in that boat, I am not meaning to offend you, but I am meaning to say, think. Just think. And when I get done with some of my proofs, which are very few, in comparison to how much could be pulled out, but when I blow our minds of the creation of God, then tell me if you want to stick with your evolutionary theory, which is all it is. It's not proven, so it cannot be called fact. And if you want to stay with that, well, that's your choice, but I'm going to say if you use the brain God gave you, there's my belief in my God. I don't think you'll be able to come to that. Well, I'm um, saying this next sentence. Start turning to Psalm 19, 1 through 5. I love Psalm 19, 1 through 5. There is so much here. I've got to watch that I don't spend our whole class right here. Well, Psalm 19, 1. Let me just say that the fact that there is no, ref uh, no refuting concerning evolution considering the mythological, I can't say that word, the myths, the theories that are out there. It may be because it was written before those things developed. Um, we know that it was written soon after the creation of man. We have the written account. At that time, and I'm talking about in Adam's day, Adam's day, I don't think anyone doubted the reality of there being a God. I don't think there was an evolutionist around right outside of the garden, I'll put it that way, okay? Or the fact that God was the creator. Maybe there was, is an argument out of silence, but I don't think it was. I think all those theories, all that's tried to debunk it, has come down the line through time. Now, when we look at uh, Psalm, when, uh, I'm sorry, just Psalm 19, not 119. Psalm 19, verse 1, we have the heavens are declaring... <clears throat> That's your King James. New American is our telling of the glory of God. And their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day force for speech. That's words. Speech is talk. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, There are nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Wait a minute, it just said there was speech. Now it's saying there isn't. What is it saying? It's saying that even though they're not literally speaking, they are speaking. Have you ever heard the expression, your actions are speaking so loud I can't hear a word you're saying? <laughs> okay, well, they're speaking. Their actions are speaking. We have voice. It's revealing knowledge. Their light has gone out through all the earth, their utterances to the end of the world. In them, he has placed the tent for the sun. It goes on. What's my point? I love when I get into the Hebrew, and the Hebrew tells me it's declaring, it's narrating, it's telling. There is a story here that's being told. What's being told? It tells us the glory of God. 
What's the glory of God? Hmm. I wonder if there's scripture to help us know what the glory of God is. And this may be off of your papers, so if it is, just jot it down. Go with me to Hebrews, a very good book for Jewish people. But you know what? It's good for Gentiles, too. <laughs> Go with me to Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to look just at the first couple verses. We're not going to, to get too carried away here, but this is important. In Hebrews, talking to the Hebrew people, we've got a group of people who time has marched on. We've had Yeshua live his earthly life. We've had him return to heaven. We've had the new plan that's showing that there is a one new man, which means Gentile and Jew come together, same footing, equal footing, same way to come to the Father. It's through the Son, the Passover Lamb, who has shed his blood, who has redeemed us from our sins. Yet they're having a little hard time getting adjusted to this new way of thinking. And they've been taught if you're not in the temple and God comes to fulfill his promises to the Jewish people, you're not in the commonwealth of Israel, you're out, you're going to miss out on the promises. So when the temple started pushing out the Jewish believers who were saying, we don't need to make the sacrifices because we have our sacrifice once and for all now, now they were a little bit concerned, wait a minute, we're not at the temple. If we've gotten this wrong and Messiah returns to his temple, are we going to miss out on the blessings? And they, they were concerned. Remember, they didn't have what I see in this room. What, 25 Bibles in this room? They had scrolls that were the manuscripts that we have our Bibles from. And they didn't have them in every home. There were very few and far in between at this point. So they couldn't just, hey, let me grab the Word of God, let me study and let me read it. They would gather together and study when they had a chance to be involved with the, the scrolls, with the, the writings. You hear when Shaul Paul was in prison, he said to Timothy, bring the scrolls with you. I need them. Oh, I can, I know his heart, I know he was hungry spiritually. And he was saying, I need the Word of God. Do you realize how privileged you are? Yes, amen. I probably have as many as I'm seeing here in my home. Different versions, different reasons. I'm spoiled rotten. <laughs> but if I leave that sitting there and I don't open it, wow. I'm sitting on a gold mine and I'm not getting a bit of good out of it. And I encourage you, get into it, read it, and study it. And because they didn't have that available to them, because they're going a lot on what they've been taught, heard, repeated, taught over and over and over, habits are very hard to break. Yeah. Habits can be good, but you want your habits to be good, because the Yiddish proverb tells us how hard a habit is to break. If you take away the H, you still have a bit. You take away the A, you still have a bit. You take away the B, and you still have it. And that's how hard a habit is to break. <laughs> well, their habits teaching them. They needed to learn the completion of Yeshua. They needed to understand that full picture. Remember when Isaiah 53 was written, when Psalm 22 was written, we have a picture of Psalm 22 crucifixion so clear. 700 years before crucifixion was a mode of punishment. Isaiah 53, the lamb going before his, his slaughters, silent, picture of Yeshua. On trial, opening not his mouth. We see so much. That's typology. That's what I was teaching you earlier. We see all of that in Scripture. They're having to learn the wholeness of it. We have the privilege of looking back. We have the privilege of grabbing our Bibles at any time. So they needed reassurance that they had gotten off track, that they weren't away from God's will and God's way. And God did a beautiful thing. He wrote them a whole book, a long letter to teach them to help them understand. And he starts off right in the beginning of that book, and he says, God, Elohim. Who is this Elohim? He's the one who spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets. <coughs> okay, Jewish mind, click. I know who the fathers are. That's Abraham, Yisach, and Yaakov. That's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I get it. He's talking about my great, 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 somewhere in their granddaddies. Okay? And in the prophets, well, I know who the prophets are. Yeshaya, Isaiah, 
Daniel, Daniel, we've studied. Haven't we had one? Wonderful. Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Hezekiel, Ezekiel, the minor prophets, they're just as important. That's not major as in the major leagues and the minor leagues. You've got your A team and your B team. No. You know why they call them major or minor? By the size. That's it. If it's a long book, it's major. If it's a short book, it's minor. That's all that it means. So, Micha, Micah, just five chapters is every bit as important as the longer books. We've got so many prophets, and these Jewish people had to been thinking, oh, okay, we're on the same page. This is my genealogy. These are the ones that we know represented God to us, because remember, we haven't seen God, but we've heard him speak to us through the prophets. He spoke in many portions and in many ways, many portions, many scriptures, in many different ways. We see sometimes, we see one time, he spoke through a donkey. <laughs> I put it nicely. <laughs> we see other times when he spoke in the, the, the bed. We saw that he put Eliyahu, Elijah, in a safe place. Let the whirlwind go. And then he spoke in a still, quiet voice. We see many different ways. We see miraculous ways. We see quiet ways. But we see a variety of ways that God spoke. And he always spoke the same message. Have you ever noticed how none of your Bible disagrees when you have someone come to you and say, oh, it's full of contradictions, ask them to name one. Just My name dad, one. My dad was more than he said it counterfeited itself in the Bible. But he was Mormon. Exactly. He was not of faith and he didn't read the scriptures accurately. If you read them accurately, you have a problem, scripture will reveal it to you. It will show you. It never disagrees. So this God who spoke all the way back to Abraham, and by the way, that's Oh my goodness, okay. 3,000 plus years, I'll say, by the time it's being written. You've got Abraham way back predating. Most say you've got a 1445. I'm trying to think of Abraham's time. Um, somebody you want to Google it, give me a timeline, but I'm thinking about 3000 BC, if I'm remembering right. You've got him being mentioned, God spoke in his day. With the prophets, we can come down. We know Daniel was 586 B.C. approximately because we know the time of captivity. Okay, and then you come all the way down. We're in, probably we're in the 50s, could be into, well, probably just the 50s is close enough, A.D., that these words are being spoken. And he's saying now, in these last days, at this time, he's spoken to us also. The same way he spoke to our grandparents, the same way he spoke to our prophets, he's spoken to us also. How's he spoken to us? In his son. Amen. Now, why did I bring you there? We said that the heavens are declaring the glory of God. Why am I talking to you about the son? Because if we keep reading, it says, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. What did we say? Who created the world? The Son. Right here we have one of the scriptures that tells us the Son created. Now we're kind of getting on track as to why I'm saying it. But verse 3 is the one that's going to jump out the page to tie in with Psalm 19, 1. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. What's that saying? Is saying this one, the sun, is the radiant glory of God, of his glory, of God's glory, the one speaking. God saying, I spoke through the sun. He is the express radiant glory of me, the exact, exact representation of his <coughs> nature. It's as if you could hold up a mirror to God and see on the other side, Yeshua Jesus. Now, I say it's almost because our mirror isn't quite perfect. But God and Jesus are perfect. Perfect reflection. Because that's what it's telling us here. Exact. Exact. So when it says that the heavens are telling the glory of God, the heavens are telling the sun. The heavens are telling about the sun. Now, we're not going to go into it now. We'll go into it a little more later because it will be all the way in Genesis 15. But in Genesis 15, 6, when God took Abraham out to look at the stars, and remember we read in Psalm 19 that they have speech, 
that they're uttering, they're talking, they're giving us knowledge. God declares when Abraham looks at the stars with him, and he says, so shall your seed be, God declares Abraham righteous on the basis of that. Now, I got a good question for you. Abraham, you're being promised that you're going to have lots and lots and lots of children. Does that make you righteous? No. no. What makes one righteous? Believing. Believing in the Son. So when Abraham saw the stars, and God said to him, narrate it, tell it, what's the story? That's what, when Abraham saw, and he, the scripture says he saw my day, and when we get to Galatians 3 that says the seed is Yeshua Jesus, Galatians 3.16 gives us no room to doubt, no room to say, oh, Rochelle's concocting this. No, it uses the same word. The seed is Yeshua, Jesus. Now we know that Abraham looked at the stars, told the story of Yeshua, Jesus, the creator, who is also the glory of God, the exact representation of his nature. And I'm looking down through that gospel given in the stars, saw the day of atonement, saw the resurrection, put his faith in the Son. Not in the S-U-N, but in the S-O-N. And that's what God said. I count to you righteous. It's as if Abraham was fast-forwarded, time-traveled, stepped in a day when Yeshua was here, died on the cross, raised from the dead, and, Yeshua, and, and Abraham said, I believe you're my Messiah, my Savior. I want you as my atonement. I want your blood in my place. All of that is what we're getting from this. Is that not awesome? Oh, yeah. Is that yeah. not amazing? That is what we are seeing. God doesn't need to do anything to prove his existence. Everything proves it. Nothing leaves any room for any doubt. When we look at scripture, oh my goodness. <coughs> Hang on, let me get to it. But let me give you, before I forget, a little bit more on Elohim, and now I'm going to come back to our creation. I can't wait. I love it. I get all excited. Okay. <laughs> Elohim, I told you, is plural. What they call it, they call it a uniplural noun. U-N-I dash plural. Uniplural noun. Unity and plural put together. Yes. That's the way that they will refer to it. And it's always used with a singular verb when it's talking about our God, okay? It's always written with a capital G for us when it's talking about our God, because in the Hebrew, when it talks about false gods, it'll, it'll use the word Elohim still. But we can tell the difference because we will see it with a capital G in the um, complete Jewish Bible, some Bibles, maybe not the complete Jewish, but some will put a slash because they don't feel worthy of writing out the name God, so they won't put in one of the vowels, they'll leave something out. But when you see capital G-O-D, capital G slash D, that black marker is not good. Fab, why did I put God in black? <laughs> Colors mean something, right? Here we go. There you are. Okay, so this way, if your Bibles are that way, or if you see God, anytime you see that capital G, you know it's Elohim, and it's referring to the one true and living God. Notice how I say one true and living God. Now that one true and living God in verse 26 in chapter 1 in Genesis, as we go back to Genesis, we're going to see that he refers to himself in the plurality. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, then Elohim said, let, I lost my place, let us make man in our image. Okay? Go to chapter 3 and verse 22. Chapter 3 and verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, hello, pay attention, don't miss this, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Okay, so God's referring to himself in plurality. Why is he doing that? Because he is plural, because he is God the Father and God the Son. He's not talking to the angels. They were not, man was made in the image of the angels, man was made in the image of God. Do we look like angels? No. 
No, the descriptions that we get are few and far in between. Who knows how much? But we know some angels have six wings. I don't have any. There are times when I'm stuck in traffic, I'd love to pop out a wing and get up and go. <laughs> there are faces. Sometimes the angels have four different faces. We have one. Thank God. I have enough trouble to one. <laughs> but we do not look like angels. We're not created in their image. We're created in the image of God. And in some way, God takes on a form to show that to us. Because even when we read about God the Father, we read of the Ancient of Days in Daniel. We read that he was sitting on the throne. We read that the Son comes and takes the scroll out of the Father's hand. We read a description that we can tell is both. Not just one, but both God the Father and God the Son, where he has hair that's white as wool and eyes that, that are like fire. It goes on and it explains. Now, does that mean that God's human? No. God the Father never existed in human form. God the Son did. God the Son chose to limit himself. Remember we talked about that last week that just absolutely blows my mind that, that God who is bigger and greater than this universe could put himself into one form, confine himself and be born as a baby. Wow. Wow. Yes. At this point, do the Jewish people believe in the Son since Elohim is plural? If you're talking about those who are in Orthodox Judaism or even less um, conservative or reformed, they will not. They will say, oh, that's the royal we. God's not referring to, uh, to the Son of God. He's referring to himself as we talk about majesty being so, so majestic that it's, it's the royal we. Even though the word Son is there, even though I can take them to Proverbs 30, the first four verses that talk about the one who keeps the wind, the one who, I don't remember all the points of creation that's mentioned, but it comes down to the verse and says, and what is his, well, it, it asks you who is he, and the answer, of course, is God, 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 and what is his name. son's name, if you can name it, and they'll stop silent and they'll say, don't know, don't know. They don't want to believe it. It is right there in their scriptures. But no, they do not want to believe it. When my dad was little, he went to Hebrew school after regular school. I think he was about six. And he was reading, and he read in the beginning, he read Bereshit, Barat, Elohim. And when he translated it, he said, in the beginning, gods. Well, this is many years ago. This is back in those olden days. And the ruler came down on his knuckles. And he looked at this rabbi and he says, what did I do wrong? And he said, you said gods. And he looked at the word and he says, rabbi, is not Elohim plural? Isn't that gods? Oh, he says, I'm sorry. He says, I forgot to tell you. Anytime we talk about God, he is so big, so majestic, that we talk as if he's more than one. But you should always only say God. That's what he was taught in Orthodox Judaism. They don't want to see the fullness of what is there because to them, we worship three gods. And they know the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other god before me. That's why they literally lost their heads when the Crusaders would come through with a cross and say, bow down to Jesus or it's off with your head. Well, that's another god. So they wouldn't bow down to Jesus. And it wasn't Jesus who was asking them to do that. The Crusaders were not representing our one true and living God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. That's never his way. Wow. Yeah, well, sadly, in, wow. In Genesis, right in Genesis 4, 22, it says, and the Lord God. And in the original, is it also, is it self-existing, a self-existent? God? Does it also say Lord God? It probably does. I'll go look at 422 for you in the Hebrew later, but it probably says Jehovah Elohim is what my guess is. It might say Adonai there, but uh, but I'd have to go look and see which it is saying. And we will talk about what it's meaning, but that's a good point to bring out. It does also mean Elohim is a self, or the self-existent one. It, he's dependent on nothing to exist. Um, Okay, I think I've done all of this. I brought out Echad, and I brought out Yahid. Um, okay, we'll look at it right now, too, when we get right down to the, the nitty-gritty of what the, 
the word means. When you're dividing a word down like this, it's called the etymology of the word. That's when you go back into the roots as far back as you can go and divide it and divide it and divide it, tear it apart, see it in all its little bits. That's how we get things like um, seeing sun and barah, that sort of thing. When you bring it all the way down, L, the E-L that I told you, all this L, Elah, and Elohim all mean God. L in the, the Hebrew, they will tell you, means strength. That's um, often the, the word that most of the rabbis will agree on, that this is strength. This is a God who is strong, in other words. Now, when they use the word Allah, they're saying that what that is referring to, Allah, means to bind oneself by an oath. So God is, is binding himself to his word, to an oath. He is declaring. Remember, Scripture even tells us when God can swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Okay, that's what it's referring to. And if he is binding himself to an oath, the word that we get from that, faithfulness or faithful. Okay, the strong God who is faithful or the strong one who is faithful probably is a little more accurate to say from the Hebrew. So all of this, you can bring it down to say that this all means, I hope you can see, I hope it's not too low, the strong one, and I'm going to capitalize it because anytime I refer to God, I capitalize the strong one who is faithful. Now, I don't know about you, but right now, I gotta let it out. Hallelujah! <laughs> He's faithful. He is faithful. He tells us that in the first three words. The God who created this universe. That's power. That's strength. That's might. And it's one who did it. It wasn't the gods. Remember later, Shaul Paul's going down the is where he's seeing all the gods. The God of nature, the God of rain, the God of the sun, the God of this, the God of that. The Egyptians, your ten plagues, the nine of them anyway, were against the Egyptian gods. The one God. He's strong. I don't know about you, but I don't need a wimpy God. <laughs> I need strength. The strong one who is faithful. Perfect timing. What are our words? Our God wants a water. <laughs> okay, go with me real quick to Romans 4.17. Let me show you some of the faithfulness, the, the strength of our God. He is just awesome. And hang tight because I got some good stuff from this. Romans Not that this hasn't been good. Romans 4, verse 17 tells us, as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, okay, the one who believed in, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. What did he call into being that did not exist? The whole thing, the whole world. When God created the world, he created it out of nothing. It didn't exist before. He brought it out of nothing. Do you know what that does to the evolutionist theory? Slime, riverbank, thing, division, just happen to come together, male and female, and all the rest to come into order to develop into the body that we see in a baby today? Oh my goodness. Did you say uh, verse 17, Romans 4? Romans 4, 17 is what I just read. That it calls into being what, what didn't exist. That's creation. Creation of everything. Creation of this entire world, this universe, everything. And the first part that shows us his strength, who gives life to the dead. Has science created life in the test tube yet? No. No. They have not been able to take nothing and create life. They have not been able to bring back anyone from the dead. And I'm not even going to put the word yet after it because only God can do that. Yeah, verse uh, 17 talks about Abraham. When he, yes. That he's a father of many nations. Yes. How is that creation? That's not. Keep reading the verse. Yeah. yeah. 
that, that is Abraham, in the presence of him who, who in him right. whom he believed. Who did Abraham believe in? God. Even God. Which God did he believe in? He believed in the God who gives life to the dead and the God who calls into being what didn't exist. That's where it is. That's where creation is. Bringing into being what did not exist. The, the last part. Go to Hebrews 11.3. Let's see if that helps you. Hebrews. I should have told you to keep a finger there, but I didn't remember. Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. I love it. Chapter 3. That, verse 3. Sorry. Chapter 11, verse 3. This is the whole chapter on faith. Full assurance in the heart. That's not F-O-O-L. That's F-U-L-L. -L. Okay? We're no fools. I don't even like that expression that says that we're fools for God. No, we're not. God never calls on you to be a fool. He never tells you to limit your mind. He never tells you to think less. He stretches us more and more and more. Full assurance in the heart. Verse 3. By faith. By that full assurance in our heart, by that conviction, we understand that the worlds were prepared how? By, by an evolutionary God. process? No. no. By the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. God didn't take visible. He didn't take matter and create the original creation. He took nothing, created it out of nothing because that's what God tells us. In the beginning, God created Okay, do I need to go further or do I read it all? I didn't read it all. I read the whole verse. Okay, that's Hebrews 11, 3. Now, when we get back into Genesis, we are going to read because, and I'll prove it later. Right now, you just have to take my word for it. Sorry, but um, the, there's no other way I can do it right now. In Genesis 1, when we're back into Genesis 1, and we look at verse 7, I think it is. Verse 7. Okay, God made the expanse separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. Okay, we're talking about God separating the firmament from the waters, and that word there, God made, is not barah. It's not God created, God made. We're going to see there's a difference when God says he created and when he says he made. Okay? So here's one of the points that's going to prove that this is a re- construction of recreation. Okay? We'll go into that later. Verse 7. God made. There's where you thought you heard the eight. God made. Okay? That word made means to make out of something, to remake, to reconstruct. Okay? Now, it, this shows that God is a personal being also, that he's not just an abstract thought, because abstract cannot create. It also shows us his omnipotence. Um, Thank you, his omnipotence, his power, okay, that he's all powerful because he could and he did create and he alone is infinite, which means he doesn't have limits. We who he created have been created with limits. He is without limits, which means he is eternal. We know that we are not eternal. Our spirit, which was put into us, God breathed because we became a living soul. That is eternal. That's why the spirit lives on, whether it lives in eternity with God or lives in eternity apart from God is what the big important decision of, of everyone's life. But that's what goes on. The shell dies. The shell is limited. Okay. Um, now, let's look at the sun as creator real quick. You know what, do I want to look at that first, or do I want to go back? Okay, okay. I'm trying to decide how to fit it all in. Um, before I go into the sun as creator, which I'm going to give you some verses, let me give you some facts, okay? Can I have some fun? I love this. I have to use my notes because I don't have a scientific brain that holds on to this. But as was mentioned, the Bible comes from a place of fact. It just starts off with the fact that God is, that he is before creation. It's not um, arguing it or anything. But the story is told of a great physic, physics, <laughs> sorry, a great physics professor's class. This, they did not name him, but they said it would be like an Albert Einstein. This was someone very, very well respected. The students in his class had decided there was no God. 
Now, the professor asked them how much knowledge in the world that they had among themselves collectively as a class. They talked to each other, and they decided they came up, and they said to the professor, we think we've got about 5% of the knowledge of the world in our class. Well, he thought that was pretty generous, but he didn't argue on that point. He just said to them simply, hmm, do you think it's possible that God exists in the 95% you don't know? Okay, simple, factual statement. God created, the Bible declares it, declares that God is, always is, always was, always will be. Now, let me also point out, it's no accident that God is the central thought through this chapter. If you count, I believe you get the word God 35 times in about 35 verses. Every point, every direction, everything created always starts with God. God created this, God did this, God did that, God, 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 God. That's the main focus, okay? The simple fact, if we can call it that, of God's creation is even more amazing when we consider the greatness of God's universe. Now, here we go. Let's first look at the vastness of the heavens of the universe alone that speaks to the majesty of our God. If our earth was represented by a one-inch ball, the nearest star would be 51,000 miles away. You ever gone on a long trip? <laughs> 51,000 miles away would be the nearest star. The moon, the planets, and a few thousand stars are visible to our naked eye, and I love that. They used to think there were something like 63 stars. <laughs> now they know how much more, but... When we see the moon, we see the planet, and we see the thousands of stars that we're seeing, it's maybe equal to a single drop of water in the boundless sea of the universe. Remember how I said, how do you put God in a teacup? Try putting the ocean in a teacup. That's about how much you can contain God. If the sun was hollowed out, it could contain more than one million worlds the size of this earth. And there are stars in space that are so large that those stars could easily hold 500 million suns the size of ours. <laughs> now, did you just wrap your brain around that? I can't. I can't. Let me give that to you again. If our sun was hollowed out, it could contain more than one million worlds the size of the Earth. And then there are stars in space that are so large, they could easily hold 500 million suns the size of ours. So 500 million suns that could hold 5 million worlds the size of the Earth just in our universe. I haven't gotten outside of our universe yet. Mm -hmm. Because this just blows my mind. It tells me how big my God is. Yes. And it makes my problems seem ridiculous. Yes. There are about one billion stars <clears throat> in the average galaxy. And at least 100 million galaxies <clears throat> in the known universe. Well. Can you write that wow. on the board, all that? <laughs> <laughs> if you want a fact statement, I'll bring it next week. Yeah, and I'll pass do. it back. Okay. okay, this is a, yeah, you can hear it again, but this is an incomparable God. Now, a typical galaxy contains billions of individual stars. Our galaxy, the Milky Way alone, contains, they think, about 200 billion stars. Our galaxy is shaped like a giant spiral, rotating in space, with arms reaching out like a pinwheel. And our sun is one star on one arm of the pinwheel. It would take 250 million years for the pinwheel to make one full rotation. But this is only our galaxy. There are many other galaxies with other shapes including spirals, spherical clusters, and flat pancakes. The average distance between one galaxy and another, 20 million 
trillion oh. miles. Oh. <laughs> we need copies of that. Our closest <laughs> galaxy is Andromeda's galaxy. That galaxy is about 12 million trillion miles away. For every patch of sky the size of the moon, if you could look very deep into that patch, you could probably see about a million galaxies. Wow! How big is our God? How great is His creation? And then when I know that I know that I know that He knows me. One of seven billion plus on the face of this earth. And he knows me so intimately that he knows how many hairs I have on my head. For a few, sorry Carrie, that might be easier to know. <laughs> but for a moth like mine, <laughs> he's got to count a little longer with me. <laughs> because that number changed his constantly. Yeah. When I see him in the split second timing of my day in some wow way, and how many other people, in how many other languages, in how many other places, and we are, we're not even a dot in this galaxy of galaxies. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I understand why evolutionists come up with their theories because it's too hard to believe. <laughs> but I have an easier time believing in a magnanimous God who created because I can see and understand his hand in a minute way also. Yeah. Then I can believe that there just was suddenly something out of nothing that somehow managed to come together and keep producing and reproducing and have everything it needed to come down into what we call man today, who, if it were true, should be getting better and better. And I'm sorry, but as of the news last night, man's not getting better. Man is getting worse. Our world is getting worse. We're hurting our world. Why isn't it getting better and better also? Many things to question, but this is the work of God's hands, and it is all over Scripture. You keep this in mind this week and start watching how many times God refers to the heavens and the earth, to his creation, all over the book of Isaiah, many other places too. I'm going to take you just a few real quick. Isaiah 40 and verse 12. And I'll tell you, I sat in a Bible class this morning that I kept writing new references down. I think in probably about 10 minutes, I got six more verses that referred to God putting out the space, putting out the heavens, putting out the earth. I mean, it's amazing. It is all through our scriptures because remember, different walks of life, different times, different backgrounds, different languages, different eras, different walks of life that they, they were from fishermen to who knows what. I mean, you know what I'm trying to say. And they never disagree. It always agrees. Isaiah, Yeshia, chapter 40, verse 12. Okay. Who? Isaiah. 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 Yeshia in the Hebrew. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? <coughs> Just that one verse. <coughs> Want to weigh a mountain? What's the mountain weigh? Tons. And our faith can move mountains. <laughs> I love all this. You can read it again for yourself. Go to chapter 48. Isaiah also. Chapter 48. And we're going to look at verse 13. These are those extra verses you don't have written down. So Isaiah 40 and verse 12. Isaiah 48 and verse 13. God speaking, surely my hand founded the earth. And my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand together. The heavens are standing because God has called them to stand. I picture a little star standing in attention to that right creator. <laughs> and I think they even bow. <laughs> we know that it says that one day everything in the heavens, the earth, and under the earth all will bow at the name of our Messiah. He is blessed.
worthy of you. Go to the Psalms. We're just going to go to Psalm 8. I already took you to Psalm 19. I could take you right back there. But let's go to Psalm 8 this time, give you a new one to look at. But I'm going to challenge you. Go find it this week. Just have fun. At least for me it's fun. And I trust it is for you also. Psalm 8 and verse 3. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you, that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? <coughs> Marty Getz even did a song off of this, so and I love it. Yes. And you sang it? Yes. 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 But heaven is just the work of his fingers. His finger, finger, finger work. Yeah. Finger work. You know, we do little finger sandwiches and we say, finger looking good. <laughs> finger work is nothing. We can do finger work and take care of a child at the same time, can we not? And if you're a good artist, you can do piano finger work that's amazing. That begins to show me a little more about the amazing finger work of our God. Well, with all of these facts, it eliminates chance. Chances I did the heavens and earth are by, they just happen to come together, like we've been saying. Chance merely describes the statistical probability of something happening. Chance cannot make it happen. Chance cannot perform anything. Chance has no power. Let me give you an example of what I'm saying. This was by uh, the biochemist Jacques Monod. I want to give credit where it's due. Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. He's the one that uh, I'm coming against. It's another one I'll tell you that, that is right. But this biochemist has tried to say, and I quote him, chance alone is at the source of every innovation of all creation in the biosphere. Pure chance, absolutely free but blind, at the very root of the stupendous edifice of evolution. Now, chance has no power, but he's saying that chance is Chance is why evolution worked, because chance worked. But if I'm right, let me show you how chance has no power. If we flip a coin, we say that you have a 50% chance that it'll pop up heads, okay? Now, that's the chance that it could land on heads. That's your statistical probability. You have a 50% chance of it landing on heads. But chance doesn't make it land on its head. What makes it land on its head it depends on how high it's flipped, the air that affects it as it's coming down, whether it's flipped when it hits the ground. There are all kinds of things that happen to it as it comes down to finally land either heads or tails. Chance cannot make it land on its head. Chance can just tell you statistics, what kind of chance it has. I heard Dr. Ken Kaur, um, if you don't know him, he was connected with Hume Lake, he, he's, he's got a great sense of humor, he's fun to listen to. And he said that, that you look at a watch, and if you took that watch and you took all its parts and you threw them up in the air, and they came back down and they formed a watch, that's how much chance there is that evolution could happen. Uh, okay? That was his way of putting it. Now, there was another scientist, Carl Sagan by name. He petitioned the U.S. government for a grant. He wanted to, to be funded to search for intelligence outside yeah. of our Earth in outer space. Okay? He hoped to find evidence by using a super sensitive instrument that would pick up radio signals from distance space, distant space, and what would show intelligence would be if there was a pattern to it, if there was something that, that showed an order. Well, he picked up the radio signals, or he picked up signals, he picked up what we call static. He could not pick up anything that showed any kind of pattern that would prove that there was intelligent design out there. Okay, to state that the universe or anything else came about by chance is, and I use his words, to sadly repeat a, quote, tired theory said and disproved before, yet unthink unthinkingly accepted. Okay. They can't think and accept it is what he's saying. Because if you think, you can't 
accept it. A tired theory, said before, proven untrue, the only way you can receive it is to not think. And I have to agree with that because look at what we just came up with. Intelligent design is so obvious that they have finally begun to come up with that accepted way. They don't want to say who the intelligent designer is. That they'll say, okay, we, we can see that there's intelligence in this design. Let me give you just a little bit of our intelligent designer, what he has done. That's inherent, obviously, in God. God is that intelligent designer is what I'm saying. This is his just right universe. Here we go again. Hugh Ross wrote The Fingerprint of God. I take this from his book. Fascinating. The universe has a just right gravitational force. If it were larger, the stars would be too hot and would burn up too quickly and too unevenly to support life. If it were smaller, the stars would remain so cool, nuclear fusion would never ignite and there would be no heat and no light. The universe has the just right speed of light. If it were larger, stars would send out too much light. And if it were smaller, stars would not send out enough light. <clears throat> the universe has a just right average distance between the stars. If it were larger, the heavy element density would be too thin for rocky planets to form, and there would only be gaseous planets. If it were smaller, planetary orbits would become destabilized because of the gravitational pull from the other stars. The universe has a just right polarity of the water molecule. If it were greater, the heat of fusion and vaporization would be too great for life to exist. And if it were smaller, the heat of fusion and vaporization would be too small for life's existence. Liquid water would become too inferior a solvent for life chemistry to proceed. Ice would not float, leading to a runway Free, uh, sorry, a runaway freeze up. Everything would freeze. We could conclude that there is no chance that such a universe could, could create itself apart from an intelligent designer. Psalm 136. And we're going to look at that real quick. Go to Psalm 136. It connects the God of creation with the rest of Israel's history. Come on. There we go, Psalm 136, and we're going to look at right from the very beginning. So Psalm 136 and verse 1. We won't read it all, but I want to get my point out. And I love how it starts. Hodi la Adonai, give thanks to the Lord. Ki to, for he is good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Ki le long pasto, for his mercies endure forever. Give thanks to the God of God. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who alone does great wonders, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Here it is. To him who made the heavens with skill, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the great lights, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The sun to rule by day, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And then he goes into Israel's history. To him who smote the Egyptians and the, the firstborn, he, raised, he brought Israel out from their midst with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, divided the Red Sea. It goes on and on through Israel's history. What he is saying is the God of this magnanimous creation is the God of Israel. He performed miracles for Israel the same way he performed the miracle of creation. And why? Because his loving kindness is everlasting. And we can bring that all the way down to us today. We can apply that to ourselves. He took care of Israel all the way through. Just keep reading and reading. It goes through Israel's history. That's why I'm not taking the time. But it gets to the end. Give thanks to the God of heaven for his loving kindness is everlasting.
Mm-hmm. Means the same thing. Thank Loving you. kindness is mercy. It, it's mercy in action. And forever is everlasting. And I give it to you in the Hebrew. The, it means the same thing. What we are seeing is the mercy of this God who loves us so. He could so easily have said, Crispy Critters, snap, <laughs> God. But he didn't, and he doesn't. And even more than that, he chose to enter into creation, into his world, into human flesh, knowing he was going to suffer at their hands, knowing he was going to be spit on, knowing he was going to die excruciatingly, knowing he was going to become the sin offering that would separate him in some way that I cannot understand, cannot fathom, that grabs such hold of me, it, it hurts me, that he was willing to take that moment of separation so that we can have an eternity with him because his loving kindness is everlasting. Wow. And all we've done is the first three words. Bereshit, Bara, Elohim. The God of creation created in love. The God of creation is the one who is in our lives today. The God of creation is the one who can stand up to the science, the scientific scientists, their, their facts, whatever they think. Even if God had chosen to write the Bible scientifically to answer all of their issues, even if he put it into 21st century scientific language, it wouldn't have made sense before our generation that understands nuclear, etc. And if we go forward, it wouldn't make sense to the generations in the future. God is not bound in time. He is not bound in space, and he can't be fit into that either. He is ineffable, <laughs> my favorite word. That is further proof that our Genesis account, as we are given in Scripture, is authentic. Take it to the bank. Not only is evolution not the instigator, but nowhere does the Bible give us room for God to use the process of evolution, which is also an argument out there today. You will hear those say, oh, well, God created it, he started it, but then he put the evolutionary process into motion. And I will ask you how, on the basis of what I've just read to you. I will ask you that repeatedly as we go through the recreation that we're going to go through. As we talk about whether it's periods of time or 24-hour days. As we talk about the balance. As we talk about how everything is just right. Do I need this anymore? No. I don't think so. But I will, because you know me, I'm never out of words. <laughs> Let's go to our son being the creator. Because we're going to look at our son as the creator. We're going to look at Elohim, God as the creator. We're going to um, see a little bit more what God created the bunks. Okay, I'm trying to get back. I want to go to, let's go to Yelkanah. Let's go to John. I love John. John 1 is one of my favorite chapters. John 1, we're going to read just verses 1 through 3. Yes, Eric is quoted right with me. In the beginning, do you think that's why I decided to choose that one? Because we're setting in the beginning. Do you think when Yelkanah and John wrote those words, he had Bereshit, Bara, Elohim in his mind? I think so. I think so. And he tells us, because God was working on him to tell us what God wanted us to know. In the beginning, and this is going to precede this beginning, because we're taking it for the back. It says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, I know he could be thinking, hey, I want them to understand creation, but i got to take them back before that point. Because my God didn't start at the point of creation. My God, the one who we call the Son, the one who is the living Word we know as the Son, Yeshua Jesus, because it says in the beginning the Word was with God. So we know it's the Son that was with the Father. 
In the beginning was the Word. Word was with God, and the Word was God. Those who say Yeshua Jesus never claimed to be God, you keep reading this book. I don't know how many times in John he claims to be God. And if you think I'm making it up and that I'm, I'm pushing Scripture to, to my view, well, let me tell you, the Jewish people in Yeshua's day who heard him speaking, they got it. They picked up stones to stone him to death. Why? Because if you blaspheme the name of God, you should be stoned to death. How did he blaspheme the name of God? They say it clearly. He claimed to be God. They got it. I get it. Yes, he claimed it because he was in the beginning with God. That's verse 2. All things came into being through him, through the word. Here is the Son creating. Apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That means the Son was involved in every step of creation. He didn't leave it for a moment to the Father alone. And the Father alone, we're going to see, didn't leave it for a moment without Yeshua. In him was life. Life was the light of man. I think I was only going, going to read through verse 3. Let's go to Colossians. Okay? Remember, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. Colossians. Gentiles eat pork chops. You know your four little verses, four little books to give you the order. We're going to Colossians 1 and verse 16. Colossians 1, 16 says, uh, I might have to back up a little. Maybe, well, Okay, 15 at least says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Remember that part too. Okay, the image of the invisible God. I'm going to talk about that invisibility in just a moment. So remember that phrase from here also. But one who is in the image of the invisible God, we know has to be Yeshua Jesus. Because we're not seeing God, we're seeing invisible. The firstborn of all creation bless you. And that does not mean he was the first baby. It does not mean that God had a child in the way that a woman gives birth to a child. This is rank. This is place. He is head over all creation. Verse 16. For by him, by this one who is the visible God, all things were created both in the heavens, on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. I think that makes it very clear. The Son is the creator. Very clear. Created everything. Created angels. They're not visible to us. That's some of the invisible. The thrones, the dominions, the rulers, the authorities. We can't see all that order in heaven, but we know earth is following a pattern from the heavenlies. We know that if there's a form of, of order here, it's reflecting something that was there. We see it in the fact that we know there are archangels. Archangels are over others. We see an angel that has a whole geographic location that's his to take care of. You know who that is? Michael, Michael, who is over Israel. He's the angel for Israel. We see all kinds of order, but we don't know what Michael, Michael looks like, do we? <coughs> Okay, and if you keep on reading Colossians, it just proves all the more. He is before all things. He holds all things together, and it goes on, okay? Look at Ephesians. Well, Ephesians, I've got Ephesians 3, 9 down. Let's look at it, but you have to look at it in King James. That was why I was going to hesitate not because of time, but, but I don't want it to confuse you later. Ephesians 3, 9, as written in King James English, gives us... Okay. Ephesians 3 and verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Mystery is something that was hidden that, that's been revealed. Which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. That's how it says it in the King James. So you can use that one if you're reading it in the King James. But again, I'll take you back to Hebrews 1 and verse 2. Remember when we were at Hebrews earlier? Uh, we won't go through the whole thing again, but Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, which says, In these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. The Son, everything's going to belong to the Son. He's the heir, the heir of the, the whole world. But it also says, through whom also he made the world. So he not only makes it, but it's belonging to him in the end also. All is his. Hallelujah. All on he is. Get to be his now and them. Okay, so I think we've shown very clearly the 
Son is creator. Have we not seen that from scripture? Elohim, we see the triunity. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Romans, there we go. I'm having a bit of trouble with my tablet. Maybe it gives you a chance to catch up. <laughs> Romans 1 and verse 20. And we read in Romans 1, 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through that which has been made, so that they were without excuse. What's this thing? That creation shows us the invisible attributes of God. They show us this magnanimous God. And because of creation, no one is without excuse. Now, I'll take you to that famous question that people love to ask when they want to talk about how God's not fair and things aren't just. What about all the people in the jungles who don't get a chance to hear? They don't have Bibles and they don't have a teacher and a blackboard in the classroom. What about them? It's not fair that they go to hell. God did that to them. Well, not only do I say, for God so loved the world, he didn't say, for God so loved the inhabited, for God so loved the cities, for God so loved San Bernardino, oh, boy, does San Bernardino need God's love. <laughs> but it says, for God so loved the world. But what this is telling us here is that creation in the jungle teaches them there is a God. Yes, they are without excuse. If they come to that light, God will give them more light. The more light you have that you sin against, the greater, I believe, your punishment is when you put yourself in hell. If you've been given great opportunity and understood in many ways and just kept rejecting and denying, I believe that your punishment will be worse than one who, only in the simplicity of creation around them, but without teachers or, or other will suffer the consequence. But even that one cannot point to God and say, it's your fault. You did this to me. Now, number one, if God went so far as to take part of himself, put him into humanity to rescue humanity, what more could he do? I mean, he stops at nothing. There's, there's no limit to what he has done to bring the salvation message. And then I bring you the proof of creation. And I bring you the story, if you've been with me before and you've heard it before, just bear with me for those who have not. This is a true story. It comes out from the Wycliffe Bible translators who know it personally. And one of their workers was friends with our family. So it comes personal. It's not a, a fable. This is a true story. There was a jungle that the family in the jungle, it was their job through the generations to create the gods. They were made out of wood. They were little wooden statues that this whole village, I'll call it a village, this whole community would bow down and worship. As it's being passed down, father to son, to son, to son, to son, we come to the generation where Wycliffe has come into the area. This son was creating one of the gods one day. He was carving out of wood. As he was carving that, he thought to himself, Remember, God gave us all a brain. He thought to himself, if my hand can create this God, that makes my hand more powerful than this God. And then he had another profound thought. Who created my hand? Who's that God? Well, fast forward a few years. And he was going on a trip to where he went to where they could buy supplies that they could not get in their village. It was his job to go get them and bring them back. Maybe he was buying the wood for the, I don't know what, but he went to buy whatever. As he is coming back through, he comes back through another jungle group, another village, and they're having an outdoor meeting. At that outdoor meeting were the Wycliffe Bible translators who were presenting Yeshua Jesus. They were presenting the God of the Bible. They were presenting salvation. He stopped, he heard, he listened, and he got so excited. And he said in his heart, that's the God who created my hand. That's the God I want to know. And he opened his heart to the one true and living God and then ran back to his community with that message. The gospel went from both tribes. 
I just wanted to say many years ago I saw a documentary on the uh, Aborigines, and in that documentary, it wasn't about God or anything, but in that documentary, those Aborigines referred to the Son of God. Interesting. And they are considered by evolutionists the oldest, I think, I believe, the oldest on the face of this earth, and they go older than what our Bible tells us humanity is. But my point being, even there is the light. God will see to it. None perish if they're willing to believe. If they have a heart, God chooses them. And he sees to it that all get the message. We see also... Go ahead. So he says the word will be preached throughout the world and then shall the end come. So they yes. will get wind of it. But they would say that it came too late for the ones who have already passed away. So oh, that's what they would say. Good example, my uh, cousin went, at a young age, young, early teen, went to um, Thailand on mission work with YWAM, Youth with a Mission. And they brought the message to this area, and a woman that was probably, a, a, I'm going to say, maybe in her 80s, weeping, tears pouring, and just accepted the Lord, was so excited to accept the Lord. And she looked at, at these kids, and she said, how long have you all known? How long have you had the truth? Yeah. And, you know, they, they didn't know how to answer, but the teacher that was with them said, you know, well, you know, we've, we've had it long before us. And she looked at them and she said, why didn't you come earlier? What about my mother? My mother had already passed away. Now, here's the thing. What about her mother? God knew her mother's heart. And if her mother would believe, even if it takes an angel whispering it into her ear, God, why would God not do that if he was willing that it said for the Son of God to die for us. I mean, that's easier. That's less. That's not as painful. You know, there's nothing nothing that will stop it. He knows from before the creation of the world. Remember, all the names are written in the Book of Life before the foundation of the world. They are blotted out when that person makes that final rejection that will never accept. Then their names are blotted out. Every name was written because God died for everyone. And it tells us in Scripture that they don't stand permanently written. And every name was written. When does that rejection take place? When they've heard it for the tenth time? When they've heard it for the hundredth time? No. That only God can judge. Don't ever judge it for God, because I guarantee you, you're out of line. Where there is life, there is hope. I don't care if they've heard it 50 million times. Tell me 50 million and one times, because you never know when it will finally penetrate. The Holy Spirit will be able to get through whatever has been the obstacle and bring them to that point. The only time I can tell you it's too late is when they're dead. There is no second chance. There's no, oh, well, I, they get to, to hear all after they leave this earth and make a decision then. No. Where you are when you leave this earth with the Lord is where you will be forever, either with him or apart from him. That's the only time I can say it's too late is when they're literally in the grave. But until that moment, don't give up on them. God didn't. Why should we? Okay? It reminded me of that story you just told that my dad used to say the story of this man had this man that created idols. And he created this idol and he took it home. And he, he went back to a maker and he says, Look, I've been praying to this this idol and he's not listening to me. <laughs> and then he, he said, Can you please make some, do do something to his ears? He put the the, the the drill all the way through and took it home and he came back and what are you doing? He can't hear me now. It goes from one ear to the other. <laughs> so true. And yet so sad because you see statues today that they put food and things down yeah. for that never eat it. They don't have a mouth that can eat. They don't have eyes that can see. They don't have ears that can hear. They don't have a brain that can think. And yet they will worship this. So sad. So sad. Before you all fold up and close on me, let me finish off my thought here because I think you'll love it. In nature, it says that God is revealed. Well, we've brought out that God is a triunity, that we see him in three parts. We see that in nature. God has stamped the, his triunity in nature. How do I mean? Let me give you some examples. The cosmos. You have space, matter, and time. You have three. Space, matter, and time. Now, let's just take space. 
And space is then divided into length and breadth and width, three dimensions that comprise our space. Time is trinity, past, present, and future. Hmm. Two of those are invisible. One is visible. Very interesting, isn't it? Matter is also trinity, two parts invisible and one part visible, because matter is energy and motion. Can you see energy? No. Can you see motion? No. But when energy and motion are manifested, you have a phenomena, and the phenomena <coughs> you can see. Remember Passover, our three layers of matzah, that's representing the triunity of God? One part comes out visible, the other two parts are not. Very interesting. Water, you have ice, water, vapor. The egg, I already said, the egg, the white, the yolk, and the shell. And mankind, man himself, mm -hmm. body, soul, soul and spirit. Mind, sure. Now, let me bring out in closing today, God created. That's what we've said. We're standing on it. We're going to deal with it as fact, and we will move forward just as the Bible does. Because God created, it, it, it uh, what's the word I want? Annihilates. It, it gets rid of, it explodes, does away with lots of false philosophies that are in the world today. It denies atheism because right from the start it assumes the being of God. It denies polytheism, which is the worship of more than one God, because it confesses there is one eternal creator, not many gods. All the others are little trees, and they don't even belong with the title. They're not a god. Number three, it denies materialism, because it asserts that there's a creation of matter. Matter began. Matter wasn't always there, so matter is not eternal. So if it's not eternal, then there goes your materialistic view that there was always matter. It denies evolutionism because God created everything, all things. It did not evolve. There's nothing that God says in Scripture evolved. It denies pantheism, which is a doctrine of um, that the universe is God. Everything is God. God's in, in the trees. God's in the ocean, God's in everything, but it denies that because it assumes the existence of God before these things. So if these things were God, how could God exist before them? And how could God exist apart from them? I'll get you in just a second. The last one is it denies fatalism. It involves the freedom of the eternal being to act. Fate is not in control. So the next time when you say, it's fate, you are denying God. And you cannot say, well, it was my fate that I ended up not a believer. No. no. Fate is not in control. The eternal being is in control. And he opens up freely for all. Okay. Last thought we conclude before the next word in English. Okay, In English we have in the beginning God created and we've covered that. Now before we get to the heavens and the earth, Hebrew throws in one word. It's a, in our English it sounds like et. Okay? It's the Aleph and it's the top. It's the first and the last letter in the, the Hebrew Aleph And very interestingly it is not, um, what do you call it? What are we doing? When it's not defined. Defined, thank you. It's not defined. It's left there to speak for itself, but it's not defined. I think because it, again, is a representation. God is the beginning, and he's the end, but he's greater than that, and that's why it was put there. Because God himself says in Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega in the Greek. I am the Aleph and the Tav in the Hebrew. So when it's saying that, I think it's showing us the God who in the beginning created is the end all, be all. How do I say it? He is from A to Z and beyond. Okay. How do I put that into words? No wonder our translators, that's what I wanted. They don't, not only don't define, they don't translate. 
they just skip it and go to the next word, I think because it was ineffable. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, we will look at the heavens, the plurality of heavens. We've looked at it in detail in the magnanimous, but we'll just start with how it, why it's called the heavens, and we'll go on from there. The heavens, the earth, we'll look at, what are we else are we going to look at next week? Oh, next week is fun. We get into without form and void. Okay? The earth was without form and void, or the earth was with form and void. If you look in your English, you're going to say, hey, I've got one of those contradictions. But if you look in your Hebrew, there'll be no contradiction. You want the answer to the contradiction? Come next week. <laughs> okay, any questions, comments? Did I cut anybody off there in the end? Okay, just should we stop the video and everything? We'll stop the video and everything and then, and then get your, okay? Okay, let me actually even close in prayer for those who need to go, they can. Those who want to stay on and, and hear what Pam's got to uh, say or ask, we'll go on, okay? God of creation, our eternal I am, the God who is at all of to talk before and beyond, who was, who is, who is to come. Oh, Lord God. We just bow in humbleness. What is man that you are mindful of him? Why did you, why were you willing to leave heaven to come to earth for your creation who had blown it? No other way to put it. If that's not love, then yes. Lord God, we have seen and spoken of your love, your magnanimous attributes. You, you're amazing. You have blown our minds scientifically. We just adore you and we just bow in awesome respect to the God of creation. And then we thank you. Hodula Adonai. We thank you for you are good. We thank you for your loving kindness this everlasting. We thank you that you are the God of our salvation. And we thank you that you freely gave it to each one of us. Oh, Lord, our hearts are so full. My words fall so short. I can't begin to express the depths of my heart. But, Lord God, you created my heart. So you know what I want to say. You know what goes beyond our English language. I thank you for the Hebrew that gives us even more understanding and more depth. But yet, Lord, I know we have fallen short. I know we have only begun to scratch the surface that I thank you that you've given us a mind to think. You've given us a way to you. You've opened up heaven for us forever that we can be in your presence thinking on these things forever and ever and giving you glory forever and ever. But even now we say hallelujah. We praise you and we thank you. And Lord God, the God of our creation, please go with each one reminding them all this week how huge you are, how small our problems are, how in control you are. Yes. What have we to fear? Thank you that you walk on water. <laughs> Thank you for loving us so. Thank you. In the precious name of our beloved Redeemer, our Savior, our Messiah, Yeshua Jesus. I'm a broken eye.